Good morning again, everyone. Uh, you'll be with us for about an hour and a half, and uh, we'll be looking at nature restoration in Europe. And I'll give you um, Federico Minozzi, I'm the head of the Policy and Projects Unit in Europark. And I'll be guiding you through this journey today uh, with the support of Esther Bossing, from, uh, who's our communication manager at Europark. He or she is. Uh, waving and she'll be taking care of the chat and uh, connection on the background for this webinar. So um, just to remind you of some of the basic rules of this webinar, as our webinars, we are recording it. I'm sure you've seen the message. Uh, we're keeping the chat open, so please use it. Take the chance to share knowledge, uh, shared links, share experiences, good practices, um, learning any material that you think relevant, because we will be collecting those and we'll share it after the webinar. Um, I know there's a lot of experiences. Some of you already mentioned me. Uh, I won't have the space to, to, to share everything, but we're happy to collect those and share them afterwards. Uh, we will allow some live interventions at the end of the case studies presentations, and we'll make sure that the presentations are available afterwards, as well as the recording. So hope this is clear. Keep your, your camera on uh, if you wish to be seen or you otherwise switch it off. Uh, let me have a word about Europark. I'm sure you're almost all member of Europark already, if you're not be ready to join in after the webinar. Uh, the organization was celebrating last year 50 years already, and we've always been working and we're still working to support protected areas uh, to preserve uh, natural beauty in Europe. Uh, we know nature knows no boundaries, and we can achieve this better if we're working together. Our members are mainly protected areas, but on, not only. And I think what is interesting about Europark is that it's not just a network of institutions and organizations, but it's really a network of people and minds who work together, stay together, spend time, enjoy time together, but have knowledge to share and, and want to share knowledge and experiences uh, to, to do better our job together. And we do a lot of things in Europark and at Europark. So I really encourage you to have a look at our website, to get engaged on our social media. Um, there's a lot of events happening. Uh, and let me mention the, the European Day of Parks on the 24th of May. Uh, this year, we'll focus on, on voting for nature. So an opportunity to organize events and uh, let your decision makers get engaged to support nature uh, in Europe and protected areas. This uh, webinar is part of a big project. I'm sure some of you are already part of the project and, and have been part of this process, which is Life Enable. Project is, is slowly coming to an end after there are a long process, but has been developing a lot of material. And, and this webinar is part of it. Um, it focuses on, on co-learning, on developing tools and solutions to improve management and support managers uh, to raise uh, their knowledge, their competencies to do better with their work. There's been a lot of happening, and I think the core is the European Nature Academy that has been uh, established through this project. A lot of training modules being set, seminars and courses on different uh, ecosystems have been uh, developed. So what is also interesting is this is uh, free of access and is being supported by the LIFE program. It is flexible, so allowing people to, to access the training at different times and adapt to adaptable to their needs uh, if you're working, if you're studying, rather. And we expect this continuing to have an impact and we're working to, to give a future to this process and keep the LIFE enabled the, the European Nature Academy alive and, and uh, a core to support uh, the development of, of competencies for managers across Europe in the future. So 
uh, nature restoration in Europe, restoring what was lost and monitoring what we restore. Uh, we will have two speakers uh, this morning. Uh, so Daniel Vute uh, from ECO, who's partner of the project. I will look at the importance of monitoring for restoration. And then Mirte Fong from uh, PWN, she is a strategy nature advisor there in the Netherlands, and uh, she will uh, introduce us at the experiences in the Netherlands for planning nature restoration, and this is also crucial. Uh, we'll give you space for questions uh, at the end, and we'll try to have good answers for, for your questions and some conclusions at the end. Before going into to give the uh, word to the two speakers, I would like just to um, try to um, give a bit of context of where nature restoration stands in the policy framework. How much have we been considering nature restoration in the past and our legislation? And um, probably have been quite busy in the past and nature restoration has not always been so present in uh, the, the legislative context and political priorities. Um, the European Habitats Directive that were developed in and approved in 79 have already been actually quite uh, innovative because identified priority, not just to maintain habitats, but also to restore them. And that's the core of the Natura 2000 network in Europe. But at a global level, going back, the CBD uh, has developed a biodiversity plan with a global biodiversity framework and it was approved in Montreal two years ago. Only two years ago, approved specific target for nature restoration, identifying that at least 30% of degraded ecosystems should be restored. And the Bern Convention, which is another binding convention uh, that covers Europe in a wider sense, um, is identified as a priority, the need to restore uh, degraded ecosystems uh, in Europe as, as a priority uh, by 2030. And this was done uh, only last year. What is fresh news, uh, as you may have heard, is the approval at the European level, so EU, of the EU nature regulation. This is really an innovative, I think, and critical and ambitious uh, step for Europe on a EU level. Uh, you might recall that the EU biodiversity strategy, which was approved in 2020, identified the need to uh, approve a regulation for nature restoration. So how can we really plan and implement restoration uh, as, as this has to be a priority for the future? It's been quite a long process. The Commission has presented a proposal and then two years of dense and intense negotiations uh, to, to get to an agreement. Probably the level of ambition is not the same as this was at the beginning of the process, but still we have a quite an impressive uh, legislation in place that will and requires just the last step to, to be a good and enter into force. It is a EU binding legislation. This means that has to be applied and implemented with clear and measurable targets. I'm not going into the micro details of the legislation, but I'm happy to share some, some uh, information there. Um, so what has to happen? The EU countries will have to restore at least 30% of habitats in poor condition by 2030, and then progressively more. This is quite a lot. And uh, the priority has to be on Natura 2000. Not only Natura 2000, but the priority to 2030 is to focus on Natura 2000 sites, even if the legislation had a broader focus at the beginning. Ensure, obviously, no deterioration of what has been restored. Uh, because we don't want to lose the work done, what it's done. And national restoration plans need to be adopted by member states. So it is really up to member states to develop their national plans on how, where to restore, how to organize the restoration. There are specific targets for different ecosystems. So for agricultural ecosystem, 
uh, drain peatlands in particular, which are crucial for biodiversity in general, but also for climate, uh, forest ecosystems. There's a target also for tree planting. Uh, there's a specific target also for free flowing rivers uh, with 25,000 kilometers identified. And urban and peri-urban green spaces are also part of the, the objectives. Obviously, approving a legislation is not solving everything straight. So it will take a long process to be implemented. There are steps to, to happen. We know restoration is expensive, uh, but we also know that it pays back. One euro can bring back eight euros. This is uh, being assessed. It is. It will stay controversial. We'll see this uh, through the case studies we'll present. We cannot ignore the importance of productive land the engagement of different stakeholders, the planning, the planning, this will here as well, the importance of monitoring and assessing results, and the fact that restoration cannot happen only on Natura, so requiring a commitment at a broader level. So Europark is really committed to support restoration and protected areas for that through learning change, capacity building, and supporting development of innovative financing mechanisms. And I'll last mention, so on, on what is the role then for protected leaders in the, in the future in all this? I would encourage you to look at the conclusions for our second seminar two years ago, because we've been looking at that and there are interesting case studies being presented there. And there are also um, yeah, good presentations that were made. But essentially, what we have been discussing is the fact that protected areas have the knowledge, have the experience. You've been running restoration plans and activities of restoration over the years. So they have, protected areas have the capacity to potentially lead and inspire also broader Asia areas restoration processes. Um, can be model and connecting gates to across restored areas. Um, protected areas are living laboratories for restoration and based on their expertise and experience in involving communities they can really foster ownership of, of processes for restoration be the bridge between different authorities local national and really the, the ground uh, of management and also pilot innovative models for financing restoration at scale so this is a bit of some ideas and reflection that emerged through time and, and that we can see in terms of the role of the protectedness in the future. And I hope this will inspire also the discussion afterwards. And I hope I didn't ruin uh, the, the presentation from our two case studies presenters, but I'm happy to introduce a bit of, of the topic and give a bit of context. So back to our case studies. Um, I will stop here and give the floor to Daniel uh, for his case study. Thank you. My name is Daniel Wutte and I will talk about a project um, that's still ongoing in Austria called Restore EO, a transparent earth observation based monitoring system for biodiversity and ecosystem restoration. Um, before I start, I would like to introduce just a short uh, of um, our company. Um, it's called ECO Institute of Ecology. Um, we are part of the Life Enable project, as Federico mentioned before. Um, we are a private research and consulting company based in Klagenfurt, Austria. And we've been working for like 25 years in a lot of countries, more than 50 countries in all Europe and all over the world. And we are focusing on protected areas, nature conservation, um, restoration, and so on. Um, and now um, we, the project I'm, I will be talking about, um, we, we're doing together uh, four different partners. Uh, we, as ECO, uh, we have a strong uh, expertise in in situ assessment um, and the other, two partners, uh, the Institute of Geography and Spatial Research of the University of Graz and the Ioannium Research. Uh, they have both a lot of experience in remote sensing 
And then last but not least, the Umweltbundesamt, the national um, environmental agency in Austria, um, um, they are responsible for the national restoration plan and also for the habitat mapping and monitoring and reporting for the habitats directive. Um, so we um, have a lot of different competencies and hope to uh, bring forward uh, this kind of um, Earth observation monitoring. The project uh, started in 2022 and will run until 2025. Um, following some of the frameworks, conventions, strategies um, they are that are mentioned in the slide, uh, we are obliged to maintain and restore areas of high biological diversity, as Federica already told us, um, and therefore also monitoring and reporting tools uh, will be necessary uh, to know more about how the conservation status of habitat is and whether our restoration measures are successful or not. Uh, currently, uh, ecological monitoring often is realized based on sample points that are regularly visited in the field. Uh, this has been the case in Austria for the National Forest Inventory or also for the habitat mapping um, for the Habitats Directive. Um, this sample-based uh, in situ approach has two advantages. Um, the first is that the parameters are measured in the field and are very detailed. Um, and secondly, the results um, are good for large-scale areas um, such as Austria. Um, they are statistically, statistically very accurate. Um, However, there's also some shortcomings. Um, the regional or the local situation can differ significantly from the overall result. Um, and therefore also the local estimates are often unreliable. Um, and additionally, the field assessments are time consuming and cost quite a lot of money. Um, so the vision of our project is to use earth observation data and techniques uh, to provide information on conservation status of the habitat types uh, to support the Austria's national restoration plan uh, and to uh, provide reliable quantitative data to the public authorities on national level and also on a regional level. Um, and we want to identify areas uh, in need of restora restoration or where restoration efforts have failed. Um, so the first step was to decide which uh, habitat groups are the most relevant for restoration efforts. And for this project, um, we selected them uh, on certain criteria that are shown in the slide. First, uh, there was the national biodiversity restoration priorities. Uh, then we looked uh, at which ecosystems could uh, benefit the most from the use of remote sensing data. And finally, third, we looked uh, for habitat groups with the highest carbon storage potential. So to support climate change mitigation and biodiversity restoration at the same time. Uh, the resulting three habitat groups then were um, grassland dominated cultural landscapes um, that are still quite common in Austria, then wetlands, including box and fence, and forests, including riparian forests. Um, first, I'd like to talk about wetlands. Based on the habitats directive uh, in Austria, we've got uh, eight habitat types for peatland. Um, like the raised box uh, or, or the alkaline fence on the two pictures. Um, for these habitats, um, their indicators is describing the conservation status. Uh, this has been published already in 2005 by the Austrian Environmental Agency, uh, which indicators uh, should be used for each um, habitat type. Uh, and now uh, in the project, uh, we are evaluating uh, if they could be measured like using remote sensing techniques. For example, like here we have the alkaline fence, a very specious, rich, beautiful habitat type, a lot of orchids. Um, there are three habitat uh, 
indicators, conservation status indicators. Um, one is hydrology. Um, for this, um, drainage ditches uh, can be detected with the laser scan model, and it still has to be looked whether the automatic detection of these ditches um, is possible. Um, then the vegetation structure is the second um, indicator. This is also measured by the shrub and tree vegetation cover, um, which could be uh, detected by uh, LIDAR data. And the third indicator uh, is the cover of disturbance species, like um, in the herb layer. Um, and this is quite difficult, or maybe also probably also impossible for now to be measured by Earth observation. And all these indicators together, um, um, from these indicators, the conservation status is derived. So this was done for all of the relevant habitat types. Um, and we show this table, it just uh, shows that some of the habitats uh, indicators are measurable with remote sensing and other indicators like species inventory, which means whether typical plant species grow in the habitat um, is not possible and is not detectable with Earth observation. Um, we have three study areas for the wetlands in this project. Um, in these areas, remote sensing data such as Sentinel-2 and laser scan data was processed uh, and furthermore field service were carried out to validate the data. Uh, we took 10 different test sites, all of, more or less all over Austria, um, and um, we mapped the relevant habitat types in the field and assessed the indicators. So for example, um, drainage um, is a major threat to various wetlands. If hydrology is disturbed, the site conditions change. Like wetlands dry out and typical peatland plants disappear. Um, and the project uh, wants to investigate how drainage ditches can be automatically detected uh, using a laser scan model. And um, in order to validate the remote sensing data and its quality, um, like uh, the drainage ditches were precisely measured in the field, as we can see here, my colleagues in standing in the water. Um, um, the second example, uh, second thing we want to, wanted to investigate uh, is the scrub encroachment on box and fence. That is a threat uh, to biodiversity. Um, if plant, uh, if um, shrubs and trees come, other species, light loving species disappear. Um, that's uh, the fact in raised box, if they are like, they have disturbed hydrology or also in alkaline fence if they are not uh, managed anymore because normally there would be some trees on it. So um, this uh, encroachment uh, of trees and shrubs um, is um, uh, not uh, good for our plant biodiversity on, on habitats and so um, uh, we wanted to know more about that. Um, here we have our test site in Syria, the Um The scent is an open raised bog, while the edge is covered with woody plants. And now the vegetation structure indicator um, I was talking about can be derived from laser scan data. Um, the change over time can be illustrated like if laser scan data is available. Um, here, uh, for this case, we have data from 2010 and 2017, um, and we see the analysis uh, whether the, how the vegetation height has changed within the two years. Um, the yellow areas uh, show an increase of vegetation height, uh, while the violet, dark violet areas uh, indicates a decrease like maybe removal of single trees or shrubs within the bog. Um, so overall for the Bürgschachenmoor, it can be stated the scrub encroachment is 
uh, still ongoing, but it's it's quite stable overall. Um, so it means that this is quite successful conservation of the status. Uh, and then we went out to, in order to validate the laser scan data uh, and the classification that was done um, when we measured the cover of all the different tree species and shrub species in this area. Um, and now the comparison of the field assessment and the remote sensing data, as well as the fine tuning of the classification are the next steps and um, will be done in the next months. Like coming back to restoration uh, for the wetlands or a practical example, um, on the picture we can see the test site in Klagenfurt. It is a Natura 2000 site, uh, Landspitz, um, and this is managed by our company, ECO. Um, this area was an alkaline fan um, once upon a time, let's say it like that, um, but it was abandoned. So um, many protected plant species are disappearing, already disappeared, and this autumn, um, the fen was uh, cultivated with a cultivator. Um, bushes and trees were cut down, uh, so the area could be or can be mown again in the future. Um, the challenge will be to find farmers who want to mow the area because it's wet and it's not that easy, um, or at least that they take the grass. Uh, we we get there. Um, and like uh, for conservation um, would be probably uh, good and would help um, to find more farmers uh, taking or, or mowing such um, fence uh, if we would have higher payments under the agri environmental scheme. So we hope that uh, also this restoration law could could change or could higher the payments for in, in terms that we get better results. Um, the test sites is, as mentioned, uh, also in our test uh, area. And so we are also uh, curious how this restoration um, will be measurable in the remote sensing data. So, the second thing I would like to show you um, is um, grasslands. Uh, traditionally managed grasslands um, are very common in Austria. Uh, colorful, beautiful, many plant species, many insects. Um, and uh, the habitat types, uh, lowland hay meadow and mountain hay meadows, still uh, quite widespread. Um, they are traditionally mowed, mown once or twice a year. Um, uh, but in recent years, um, there's a decline of these habitats um, because the management of meadows has become more intense. Um, uh, and of all, a lot of fertilizers uh, are used. Uh, and so um, the species um, richness declines uh, and um, species poor intensive meadows develop. Um, and now we were thinking about how to detect uh, these uh, intensive meadows uh, and to detect changes if like a, a habitat type uh, becomes an intensive meadow. Um, um, and we could, we thought that it could be detected with the help of remote sensing data uh, um, by the dandelion, Taraxacum officinale in the meadow. It's a plant species that indicates high nutrient availability. Um, and the dandelions, you probably know all of them. Uh, all of you will know the dandelion. Uh, it is um, very common and it's very com common in intensive meadows and it's an indicator species for poor grassland. Um, and uh, in, at a certain phenological stage in springtime, um, it colors like so, uh, these meadows are colored yellow, um, very, um, you can see it uh, from far. And that's the idea to see whether this is recognizable also by remote sensing. 
Uh, however, the window of opportunity to, to see this yellow is quite uh, narrow as after two, one, two, three weeks, um, um, the meadow then is colored white by the then the lion ripe fruits. Um, and so um, we, we visited uh, various meadows in Carinthia mostly um, when the dandelion was in flower and we recorded the density of the flower, like the percentage of the cover, uh, and also the phenological stage. So whether it was start of flowering, full flowering, or partially withered. Um, and well, we, we took this data, put it into GIS files, uh, and now we are working on the comparison with the multi-temporal sentinel data um, to check whether uh, the dandelion flower is recognizable and which uh, what flower density is needed on a meadow to be detected on the sentinel data. Um, this uh, is one thing we do and, and the, the other thing uh, we also like intent to detect intensive meadows and um, in like species poor meadows which could be restored uh, um, is um, to investigate uh, how often they are mown because um, if meadows are frequently mown biodiversity declines uh, and so for example um, also if and also it's important when uh, at what which time a uh, meadow is mown if all the meadows are mown at the same time, so insects do not have any chance to hide anymore. Um, and mowing events are also associated uh, like with a sudden decrease in the NDVI, the, the normalized difference vegetation index value. And um, this algorithms uh, has been developed and tested. Um, and we are doing like ECO is now doing the ground truthing of this data and um, we go out to see when the mowing event really happens in the field and this data will help us to check and to improve the algorithm. Um, okay, so the, within the project also the indicators for forests uh, were investigated um, like the detection of lying dead wood or the vertical structure of parameters uh, both like from LIDAR data, uh, but I won't go into detail as um, my colleague uh, last week already talked about a similar project. Um, so we are still um, within the project. The next steps will be that we will go out to get additional field service because um, we've seen where we need some more data for the valuation of the remote sensing data. And then we will continue with the testing and refinements of the remote sensing uh, data and develop the methods. Uh, and in the end, like mm, this and next year, uh, the next steps will be uh, that these methods will be demonstrated and tested in priority areas for restoration in Austria. So I would like to conclude with some um, impressions from the field work, because that's what I do often and I really love. Um, um, personally, I'm convinced that uh, also in the future, we will still have the need to go out to see uh, in, in situ how the conservation status is of habitats. Um, but I think, um, however, there will be a, a a useful combination of earth observation and field service. Um, like instead of visiting an area every 10 years, maybe like a random area every 10 years, maybe we just go to places where remote sensing indicates that there has been some changes and then we can see how exactly was the change and whether it was good or bad um, or if restoration was uh, successful or not. Um, well. So uh, in, co in connection with the restoration regulation law now, however, um, I think um, the need for monitoring um, will be higher than now. 
and um, we will need data across the whole territory and earth observation could help us. Um, there's a lot of projects, similar projects in Austria and probably also all over Europe. And um, I think my personal opinion is that there's with um, a bit of cooperation um, of different institutions and different nations, uh, we could uh, accelerate this development of these techniques, which could help us. So that's it. I thank you all for your attention. I thank the project team um, and say bye. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Um, yeah, don't disappear because I see a lot of questions uh, that you have been uh, following your your presentation. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, no, I see questions on Dandelion in particular and many other aspects. I hope you have the answers and uh, feel free to start answering some of them and we'll give space for discussion at the end of the second presentation. Uh, share the importance of finding the right indicators uh, and is essential to make sure we can monitor uh, then the, the restoration processes and results that we achieve on the ground. So thanks again for, for the inputs and we'll, we'll come back to you uh, shortly. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Mirte Fong, who will introduce a bit about her process and projects in the Netherlands. Yes, thank you, Federico. Um, I will share my screen. Yeah, very good to be here. I'm very happy to tell something about uh, the nature restoration work we do in uh, the Dutch dunes. Um, I'm Mirte Funk. I work for PWN, um, which is a nature conservation organization and drinking water company in the Netherlands. And to start, I think it's good to, to give a little bit the uh, sense of place. Um, where are we? We are in the northwestern part of the Netherlands and we manage to two out two thousand June areas. Uh, together they are more than nine thousand hectares uh, big. Uh, we are we are lucky in the Netherlands to have quite broad June areas um, almost along the whole coast, which have been very well protected. Um, not only because of their natural values, but also because they play a role in uh, in fresh water uh, uh, storage and, and as a source, and of course uh, in coastal protection. Um, so as Dutch, Dutch people, we, we rely on uh, on the dunes, and I think that's uh, very often the best guarantee for uh, for protection. Um, in the Netherlands, we have almost ten percent of the grey dune habitats in Europe. Um, which is a priority in a 2000 habitat type and quite vulnerable. Um, so we have quite a large responsibility, um, uh, not only on a national, but also on a European level to keep the dunes in a favorable uh, condition. So that's what we are working on. Uh, and that's quite a serious task. Um, I made this, uh, this is just a part of the fact sheet on the, of nature restoration um, uh, 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 in the EU, and I highlighted uh, two sentences, and it says that peatlands, grasslands, and dunes are worse affected. Um, and if if we look into a little bit more detail on it, um, like third from below, there are the dune habitats, and you can see that uh, the the state of these habitats it's almost like nearly eighty percent is in poor or bad condition. Um, um, so there's a lot to do, and there's a lot to restore. Um, and in the Netherlands, we have uh, we identify three main challenges um, that put the dunes under pressure. And because sometimes uh, a picture says more than a thousand words, I I I, I want to start with this one. Um, we like our dunes are positioned in a very densely populated area. It's that the northwest part of the country is the most popular area for people to live and to recreate, uh, and the dunes are in close proximity of uh, 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 of, of urban areas. Um, so people in wildlife, people in nature, live very close together, um, which 
it also makes it unique. So it's also very special that you can encounter uh, a species like the European bison uh, just in front of one of the most popular beach areas, uh, Sandport and Zee, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and somehow it works, uh, but also it means that we were uh, the boat areas together. They receive a lot of uh, visitors, almost eight million people, eight million visitors a year, and that puts a lot of pressure on the area, uh, especially during breeding season, uh, and it causes a lot of disturbance of um, of species that are vulnerable for this. Uh, so that's one of the one of the the main challenges we face. Um, and another one. <laughs> This is also something that makes the Netherlands special. Um, on the EU level, they call us a low density city. Uh, and I, I, I kind of like that um, phrase. Um, and here you see how, how land use in the Netherlands is divided uh, by, um, by, by use. And yeah, I think what, what is striking is the enormous amount of land that is used for agriculture. Um, it's almost 70%. Um, so they also say it's we are some somehow a, an agricultural superpower <laughs> within an urbanized society, and of course this puts a lot of pressure on on the environment. Um, on the left, you see well, you don't have to look into much detail, but it's it's the amount of manure nitrogen manure input um, in an area, um, and you see that the, the Netherlands are very dark on this map, um, and. Um, um, so yeah, nitrogen deposition is uh, is a huge threat to especially the dune area because uh, from origin, these areas, the soil in this area is very nutrient poor. So nitrogen acts as a fertilizer and cause uh, vegetation overgrowth. Um, so that's the second challenge. And the, and the last one or the third one is, this is a very recent picture of the dunes. Uh, and yeah, I would say um, the third one is climate change. Uh, it's not necessarily a huge problem for nature on itself because the nature in the dunes is quite dynamic and is able to adapt quite well to this more extreme circumstances. But it, uh, yeah, it puts a lot of pressure on uh, the infrastructure, um, on agricultural land at the inner dunes and, and the housing. Um, and on the other hand, we experience a lot of droughts during summer. So we have we have these extremes we need to deal with uh, and be very clever about water management um, in the future. So to summarize, what are the main pressures? Um, recreational pressure, nitrogen deposition caused by industry and agriculture and uh, uh, climate change. Um, but luckily, uh, uh, we have this uh, this broad uh, dune areas um, and a lot of potential to restore and increase the resilience of the area because that's something, uh, uh, yeah, resilience is something that's needed. Um, so that's what we aim for. And we defined like three main focus points in our management. The first one is to connect nature uh, because of our yeah, densely populated uh, uh, a uh, country, uh, a lot of nature is fragmented. So uh, we have roads crossing the area, um, villages, towns. Um, so we work on ecological corridors, uh, fauna bridges, fauna tunnels, but also on land use change. So um, uh, trying to transform more intensive, intensively used land uh, into extensively, ex extensively uh, used land uh, or uh, natural. Um, areas. Um, the second one is to restore natural processes, uh, which are, of course, very important uh, in the system. Uh, well, we, you can also call it rewilding of the area. Uh, we do so by working on dynamic dunes, uh, by restoring natural grazing uh, regimes, and by restoring the natural hydrology of the system, which has been influenced in the past quite a lot. So that's also very important basic condition. And the third one is to improve the balance between people and nature, uh, which is also quite a, a big task. Uh, we try to, re to reduce the pressure, um, mostly of, of recreation, by zoning the area and by trying to expand the amount of nature in the surroundings of the dunes, but also by connecting people with nature. Uh, because already well, I told you that uh, 
people in nature are living quite close together in Netherlands, but we don't feel very connected to nature. Um, so we visit nature, but we don't really feel part of it. And that's something also well, we, we work on with well, within our visitor centers and uh, education uh, programs. Um, but for this webinar, I want to go into a bit more detail about two restoration projects we do. Um, one of it, it's about um, well, connecting nature, restoring uh, hydrology, and reducing pressure. And the other one is uh, about the restoration of uh, natural grazing. Um, well, as I already told, is that um, in our area, like especially at the whole eastern border of the area, um, there's quite a strict line between quite strict separation between nature and the polder area. Um, there is quite intensive land use uh, at the east side, uh, intensive growing of flower bulbs, uh, problems with water management, a lot of paved grounds and a lot of drainage, uh, which affects, of course, the nature values of the dunes and also the, the whole hydro hydrological cycle. Um, and especially insect species also suffer from these kind of practices. So we are trying to, to restore and work on a more natural transition zone between the dunes and the polder, uh, of course, in cooperation with local government, uh, landowners, farmers and uh, local inhabitants. Um, well, this is you, you don't have to, <laughs> to read this, this map, but uh, I just included it to to um, to show that like the, the the black and white dotted areas they are meadow bird areas which are more at the at the polder uh, uh, part of, of, of the province um, and the, the the yellow and dark green uh, area that's that's the dune area and then you see that there is quite a like, large zone of white and light green uh, areas which are um, urban areas or agricultural areas that are kind of separating those more natural places. And what we try is to, uh, to make ecological corridors, uh, to transform uh, land into more nature inclusive land use in order to connect those patches of nature within the province. Um, well, this is one of the examples of the projects we did uh, last year. As you see on the left uh, side uh, below, um, this is a, a agricultural, former agricultural area, which is kind of fragmenting the dune area um it's uh, the land was quite intensively used and uh we transformed it into a, a more natural area with a lot of space also for recreation and water storage um well we we these are some pictures of uh the work we did we had to remove the complete uh, top layer of the soil because it was way too rich in nutrients and also pesticides um uh, to just like um, use it immediately uh, and we created like a fair variety of wet and drier habitat types uh, and um, also some recreational infrastructure for people to to make their daily walks in the area um, well at the first it was of course like just a bare sand area but like very very quick it um it uh, well, it turned out to be a very lush and green, uh, flower-rich polder um, area um, with large uh, nature values. Um, but also, it's very um, attractive for people to recreate, uh, to to recreate, um, and uh, and and a good thing is that it, that for us it makes makes able to receive people more at the eastern part of the dunes. Uh, and thereby reducing pressure on the core area, which is way more vulnerable for uh, recreation, high recreation numbers. Um, so that's a good uh, combination. And also um, the area also works, as you can see, see it like a sponge. Um, so it helps us to keep water in the system uh, for a longer time. Um, so it protects like the fresh water uh, uh, that's inside the dunes which is very uh, valuable for nature and, and also for high quality use in agriculture or drinking water production. It prevents us from fast drainage and, uh, and runoff. Um, and very important, it also uh, prevents flooding during this more 
uh, intense rain showers that we experience uh, during the year. Um, so it um, it also it gives us a lot of ecosystem services. Um, another project that we did uh, is about restoring natural grazing regimes. These are some pictures of the grazers we have in the area. So it's the highland cattle, uh, the horses, and uh, the European bison. Um, we, we started with the introduction of these large grazers in 2005. Uh, the main reason for it was uh, a lack of uh, natural grazers in the area. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, large grazers um, in general. We have some browsers like fellow deer, uh, very limited roe deer. Um, but the most important grazer, except for insects, is the rabbit uh, in the dunes. But we have a, uh, experienced a, a huge decline in rabbit population numbers over the past 25 years without a recovery. So we had to do something. Um, so we introduced the cattle, the highlands, and uh, eventually also European bison. Um, to mainly, like the main reason was to counteract vegetation overgrowth caused by um, nitrogen deposition, um, but also to uh, try to restore um, uh, uh, essential processes within the ecosystem. Um, because it's not only grazing what these grazers, of course, do, they also use the habitats. And by using the habitats, they also have influence on species distribution and uh, uh, variation in, uh, in vegetation. Um, the conic horses and the cattle, they can just roam free throughout the area. Uh, we also have an eco bridge, which is going over the, uh, over the road, and uh, the cattle and the horses can cross it. Um, we don't we don't have any additional feeding. Uh, the bison they are in a separate area, which is enclosed, so it's around four hundred hectares. There's just one visitor pop uh, going through the area, so it's quite um, it's not very uh, the visitor numbers are, are not very high in that uh, in that place. Uh, uh, yeah, because that was was one of our major concerns, of course, after introducing those um, those those bison. Uh, what would be the interaction with? The people we're creating in the area, and uh, is that something that's going well? Well, it it's going well, so that's that's very good. Um, but it's also one of the main research questions uh, uh, we have. Um, uh, besides, of course, the way they use the habitats and um, and their diet. So this is a uh, well, just a, a very short uh, some 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 results about the habitat use and the diet of the the, the different races. Um, what you can see on the top uh, graph is that uh, European bison and, and highland cattle are very similar in, in their diets. Uh, so they are uh, mainly grazers, but they also have some woody species in their diet. And the horses are different. They, they don't include any woody species in their diet, so they are pure grazers. Uh, but if you look into a bit more detail uh, into the diet of the, 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 the cattle, um, there are some differences. So the, to the black bars in the graphs, it's bison, and uh, the gray bars, it's uh, the highlands cattle. Uh, and the biggest difference is um, uh, is the is the debarking. So the bison they include uh, way more bark in their diet, especially during winter and spring, than the cattle. And the cattle um, they eat more twigs. So there is some variation in their diet, and that's also um, re reflected in the landscape. Um, um, so like the introduction of different types of large grazers also results in more variation in uh, vegetation and, uh, and habitats. Uh, and a special feature of the European bison, um, what, we, what we don't see in the cattle and the conic horses is that they wallow. So they take some, they do sand baiting, and uh, that results in uh, a large, a huge increase of open sand area uh, in the dunes. This uh, sand patches, bare sand patches, and that's very important for uh, specific dune species. Um, uh, for example, like uh, June pansy. So that's um, that's uh, an extra feature. 
Um, well, I already told you that another important question was how would be the, the, yeah, the interaction with humans and recreationists in the area. Um, so we started uh, last year a, a, a big eight-year uh, research project with the university in order to, um, to get more insight in the interaction between human and wildlife, not only bison, but also, um, for example, fellow deer. Um, inside the area, so it's recreation is called outside the area. So uh, when they encounter, for example, the fellow deer farmland or urban areas, um, uh, some animal species will be tracked by a GPS tracker. Um, and like the main goal is to um, get more insight in human wildlife interactions in order to um, to find ways for coexistence within the area and within the Netherlands, because that's a big task for the coming years. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to tell about this research, but it's something. It's not something for today, I guess. Um, well, I want to to end with uh, uh, one of our latest projects because I already told you that one of the reasons why we introduced the large graces was because of rabbits population decline. Um, so after 25 years uh, of waiting for the rabbit population to start recovering on itself, uh, we decided to to help them a little bit and also to to start uh, a pilot project uh, of uh, introducing rabbits in the area. Um, so we introduced last year around 30 individuals in this fence little areas for two weeks just to get them used to the area. And then uh, we remove the fence and they can just go out and uh, colonize the rest of the of the dunes. Uh, so it's just very, um, uh, yeah, we just started with it. So I don't have uh, results on the effects yet, but um, I wanted to share it with you as a kind of dessert. <laughs> um, that was my talk. Thank you. And um, well, feel free to uh, ask uh, any question you have. Thank you very much, Mirte. And yeah, the interaction between people and nature is crucial. And so for restoration, uh, you mentioned the challenges and the benefits, and in particular, the solutions that you're testing and piloting in different ways uh, in the Netherlands. So very interesting. Thanks a lot for your case study. Uh, we have a bit of time, half an hour, uh, for, for questions and, and discussion. So uh, I'm happy to uh, give a bit the floor. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we have collected some of your questions uh, with, with Esther. Um, I would start for, with some questions for uh, Danny. Maybe uh, there, were, there were a couple of questions on the Dans de Lyon, one from Anne-Marie. Maybe you want to take the mic and, and raise it. And then uh, next, uh, Isabella on DNA. Uh, I see the Dandelion as an indicator species. How do you take into account that not all species of Dandelion are indicators of nutrient rich areas? And in particular, in that Denmark, species of Dandelion has been 405, 457 species have been identified. Mm, yeah, we. Um... Like in Austria, we also have like uh, a lot of subspecies uh, of this dandelion, but in the intensive meadows, it's mostly one, one um, let's say, big species, uh, and uh, other species are more found in like really um, special, um, special habitats, like very wet or very dry. So uh, we do not. Uh, take this too much into account uh, that there's could be so many different species. It's also like a bit um, like the botanic um, researchers, they often want to split every species in a lot of species in Taraxacum is a genus uh, very good to split, let's say it that way. Um, and I think, yeah, this was the question. So we, we um, consider all this Taraxacum in the intensive meadows as the same species. And we still, and we also have some other um, data about uh, from the agri-environmental scheme so that we can also 
um, it's to double check. So we see, okay, this is probably an intensive uh, meadow, intensively managed meadow. And so we still can <clears throat> exclude that this is uh, extensively managed and other dandelions would appear. And if they appear, they just appear in very small coverages, so very low percentage. So it would not be detectable on Sentinel. I My hope. microphone is unmuted now, so I can talk. Um, I agree with you that if you look at um, uh, very heavy lice fertilized ground, uh, the dandelion you're looking for is uh, can be seen well on um, LIDAR photos, but it's, there's a lot of people here. And uh, for instance, in the dunes, we have uh, some really good uh, dandelions. So if people here think that dandelions are good for all uh, habitat types, uh, please bear in mind they're not. And, and if you have an area where you do restoration and um, it is sandy, for instance, uh, one dandelion might change to a good one, and it's really difficult to see on LIDAR. So, so please bear that in mind to the restorers. I'm a botanist, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree on that. But for the intensively managed meadows, I think it's a good indicator species. Yeah. Thank good. you. Thank you. So I'm happy to give the floor to Isabella. Hi, Daniel. Um, greetings to Corinthia. Um, I was wondering if you have considered eDNA techniques. Uh, everybody's talking about them recently, and I mean, surely it has crossed your mind. Why do you think or don't think that they are uh, easy to use and applicable for the monitoring that you have to do? Um, we have some projects where we also involve eDNA um, uh, but for this um, for this project uh, we haven't thought about that yet uh, and I wouldn't know how to use it like with a remote sensing um, but it's probably also um, an idea to monitor I don't know the species richness of a of a habitat um, but we didn't to consider this now in this project. Thank, Thank you. you. And there was a question from Dorothy. I don't know if you want to take the floor on extreme weather. Oh yeah, it's uh, how the factor will impact droughts of floods um, on our selected indicators. Um, yes, probably um, the, it could be that in, in future the dandelion uh, flowers will appear maybe a bit earlier and it also changes from year to year. So there are some five, 10, sometimes maybe even 15 days that can differ from one year to another year, depends on, on the weather. Um, but in Austria, we have a lot of good phenological data uh, that is collected by Geosphere Austria. Uh, and so we can also double check it with these um, data of Geosphere Austria on phenological development all over Austria. So I think we can, can manage this problem quite well. Thank you. Um, it was a question from Vedran. Vedran, I don't know if you want to take the floor here. I'm sorry, I don't see you. So. On subcontracting, uh, maybe, but Danny, maybe you can reply on the chat or. Yes, um, we. Take the floor here. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, so yeah, the idea is just, I hope it's clear. Basically, what I'm trying to understand, Daniel, if if you also like outsource someone to provide you with lidar recordings, or you have that in house, uh, and like what's I mean, what's the what's the size of the project where it makes sense to develop your own capacities for that uh, and. Have you used the existing leader photos, ordered someone to do that for you, or you do that on your own? 
Um, in our project, um, we have like the University of Graz and the uh, Ionium Research, both dealing uh, with all this data also in other projects. Um, so they just uh, use the existing data they already have in house um, to for this project. So, um, and if there's some special questions uh, that appear or appeared in this project, they made some special processing, so, but mostly they used uh, existing data. Uh, and I think that's always good to find a project partner that uh, knows how to handle the data and maybe already has it somewhere in a cloud or storage, because it's really a lot of data managing and data um, transferring and processing, and it's good. And a lot of institutions uh, have ex a lot of experience in that, and it's good to share this experience and make like we did like project teams with different competencies, so each can cover certain things like LIDAR data or we with our ecological experience. I hope I could answer the question. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Esther, I see your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Bert, and thanks also, Dani and Mirte. Um, so we had a question from Neil for Dani, and actually I'm also interested in that, and I would actually extend this question also to Mirte. So it's about, um, you know, restoration processes or approaches, yeah, needs to be quite inclusive. Um, was this, Dani, in your project, um, was there any... Um, stakeholder involvement that, that was required? Did you organize any meetings? And Mirta, indeed, I would extend that question to you as well. You already mentioned you worked with uh, local governments, but also with um, uh, the citizens around. Um, how were these processes, these uh, stakeholder engagement processes set up? Um, like for our project, we, in this stage, we have not involved the stakeholders yet, because we are now, uh, developing methods um, that is mostly like a bit with field data collection. Of course, if we go to a protected area, we talk to the landowners, we talk to the managers, um, but that's it now for now. Um, then we process and develop methods. And the next step uh, in the demonstrator areas where we'll apply these methods and test these methods, um, then stakeholder workshops are planned and we are doing this uh, also like uh, e.g. for in, in national parks like the Gesäuse and the Kalkalpen National Park in Austria. And, and we will um, involve all these stakeholders in the next step. Um... Yeah, for, for us, it's it, especially the, the, transfer, the land use transformation is quite a, it's a very sensitive topic um especially uh yeah for for local stakeholders uh and for us because we work on the edges of of our area so it's very like it's way more simple to work in inside the protected area than like just at the borders or just outside uh yeah so we we need to pay a lot of uh, attention to stakeholder management um involve all different kind of stakeholder groups sometimes uh just uh face to face one-to-one -one person meetings and sometimes with just bigger group to inform people um, and we really learned that we we really need to pay a lot of attention about first agreeing on the problem um, before talking about solutions so that's that was for us uh, uh, yeah um, a very important point what we learned from from this process thank you thank you both um yeah stakeholder engagement is crucial uh, and we have seen we mentioned that um uh, tom i see your hand up uh, just a second uh uh there was a question uh still for me to, on how do you define nature standard restoration level in your process so what you have to reach and how you define it mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question well of course we we have the Natura 2000 um, goals, um, which which are quite uh, well stated. Uh, but what we try to do is that before every project we do, we we define, um, if, if possible, measurable 
goals, for example, um, uh, indicator species, uh, plant species, animal species, vegetation structure, amount of sand covering we want to reach, um, amount of use, for example, of, of, of eco bridges, percentage of use. Um, and then we carefully monitor uh, after, uh, after a project for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, depending on the measure we take, of course, um, whether we reach the goals that we set in the beginning. And sometimes it, it works surprisingly well and sometimes not. <laughs> and then we learn from it again. So I think it's the whole plan to check act cycle that you that you have to do. I don't know if that's answering the question, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mirte. And yes, there's always a bit of unknown what uh, nature restoration will where, where lead, but good to have a plan before. Um, there's, uh, there's a question from uh, Lydia, uh, still for Mirte, uh, Rabbit are raising uh, questions. Maybe you want to take the floor, Lydia? Uh, hello, thank you for the presentations. Uh, I don't know, it's a question that it's, I think it's uh, all over the world, this kind of, uh, you know, reintroducing some species. And then you find out that it's not something that you can, uh, you know, take hold on in it. So it was sometimes many years ago in the islands, uh, the Aegean Islands, we had a problem with the wild rabbit uh, and overpopulation. So there were many people, there was this conflict, and there were many people that were taking actions, go to go, and they wanted to address the problem. So they uh, illegally spread a disease, myxomatosis, it's a virus, but it's anyway, it's a fatal disease for the rabbits. And so the that was a very bad incident. And I, I just wondering because the Netherlands is not a so nature, you know, full for, full of nature. So uh, have you taken into account that what about if the rabbits loved the place, okay, and they want to, because they do so, overpopulate the area. Uh, so have you thought about that? Do you have enough birds of prey, for instance, to uh, prey them down or to keep them in balance? Because after that, there will be something that it will be chaos. I mean, thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, and um, we thought about it, of course, because it's, uh, yeah, it's a very valid question. Uh, and in the past, the rabbits were actually very, like doing very well in the dunes. So we, we know like the situation where we came from. Uh, and, and in that time we were hunting the rabbits. Uh, we, we cannot imagine at the moment, but it was, and there are some ranges that they, they can still remember. Um, but uh, yeah, the times changed. So by that time, there were not so many natural predators in the dunes, uh, and now there are. So we have a lot of foxes and uh, birds of prey, pine martens. Um, so we think that, um, yeah, well, that there are enough predators to keep it balanced. Uh, but of course, there's always uh, always a, a slight risk when you um, yeah when you do an inter intervention as a human. Uh, but uh, the lacking of rabbits, we we think, does more harm to the system than uh, the yeah the the risk of uh, overpopulation uh, because we think we can manage it because of the yeah the natural predators that are present. Yeah. Thank you. And Tom, you had a question. So look at a whole lot of apologies first. Uh, Google didn't give me the exact right time, so I missed a lot of the presentations. So very sorry for that. And you know I'm a little bit vocal anyway. Uh, look at you barely mentioned stakeholders in all of this. And from an Irish point of view and my point of view, the stakeholder is so important. And the term nature restoration is, to use an Irish word, raising the shackles of a lot of Irish farmers at the present time. And you think that the French and German farmers are militant, we will make them look like queer boys. I can assure you. It, it, it's really an emotive subject in Ireland when we hear about re-wetting and, and interfering with land that has been brought into farming, good farming practices, we contend, uh, to say that the, the government or EU is going to re-wet it or take it away from farming, from product, productive land. That's not going to happen in Ireland. 
And, and we know all now that there is no real budget in Europe for this project. Uh, we are told that uh, if your land is designated for re-wetting, that you will lose your single farm payment. As far as a lot of farmers are concerned now, the sooner the better the single farm payment has gone and we won't be uh, farming under the cosh of the single farm payment. We, it, it has become uh, a chain around our neck. Uh, so look, I know it's maybe a selfish stakeholder's point of view, but unless there is serious consultation with stakeholders, there will be no nature restoration. And I have worked, uh, look, I have been a long time involved in Europarks and laid my point of view on, and I have worked in a lot of restoration projects where it was suitable for restoration. We, we have a lot of uplands in our region and, and we have done loads of projects on, on, on restoration of those. And we differ on the methods that restoration should take, the actual practices that, that go on. Um, so all yeah. I can say is there's an awful amount of work to be done. And please, please, please do not forget the word stakeholder you use, I use farmers, because that's basically what we are. The stakeholders are basically farmers. So unless there is serious engagement with farmers, this project will not happen. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks for raising this. Uh, I don't think we forgot the stakeholders because we mentioned them uh, oh, no, no, no. on, but I, I'm really grateful for you to raise uh, the perspective of farmers and, and in general stakeholders, which I think we need to better define, otherwise we just generally mention stakeholders, but I think yes. landowners, land users and others uh, need to be part of the process. I mentioned this uh, in the introduction. I think this came up also in other questions and part of the presentation. So if we want to have successful restoration, in particular, if this is not happening only on public land, but also on broader landscape, we need to make sure different stakeholders, different parties are involved and farmers have to play a crucial role for the success of this. I think this is, uh, known and part of the process at EU level as well. So the priority at the moment is will be on Natura 2000, but I think we need to build a process to make sure there is dialogue and it won't come from the top. Uh, the, the planning has to be developed at national level. So we need to make sure different parties are involved in the development of the plans at national level. Um, uh, with this, um, I uh, just give the floor to Tim. I see you raised your hand, Tim. Thanks, Federico. Um, thanks, Minister and Daniel. That's really interesting. Um, and thanks, Tom, as well. You make me think about question. So uh, raising what you've just done, what you just asked, I mean, leads me to remember that I've had some conversations recently about some work we're doing in the Windermere catchment to improve water quality. So, you know, <clears throat> producing phosphorus, getting into the in, into the lake. We know that wetter is better and more woods are better for things like that. So I was wondering, Merta and um, Daniel, how important do you think really good granular data is uh, for that? And how easy is it to get to help stakeholders like farmers, for example, understand the issue and how they can help by giving them really good information and evidence to help them and inform their decision making around their land management business to support us as nature restorers? Yeah, that's 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 quite a difficult question. If I would have the answer, that would be really helpful. Um, well, I think um, it's essential to um, um, to have like some sort of common ground to to work on, um, and um, so I think it. Well, I think the the, the most important thing um, to because there is already like at the start, I think some sort of polarization or like people are a bit um, suspicious about your intentions. So I think it, it it can be really helpful to first work on the knowledge ex ex exchange, like the exchange of problems, exchange of um, mutual problems uh, without even talking about any uh, interventions or things you want to do, just first to create um, some trust and and relations and then like 
build upon this uh, towards uh, uh, interventions? I would say, yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> Yes, I can underline this, um, especially like in our habitats, uh, like the meadows and also the some of the fence, they depend on the farmers. And if the farmers um, stop managing these areas, um, the habitats will disappear. So it's crucial for us to somehow um, try to also to 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 have a good environment for the farmers so that they can survive that they can go on with their practices and they are not forced to really um in, to make their farming more intense so that the habitats suffer um but it's it's really difficult in now in this situation as we see all the protesting farmers um i think there's yeah polarization like in a lot of fields now in so social um, interaction. So we are working on that and we always try to involve our stakeholders and try to say why we want to do something or why we want to conserve some um, plant species or habitats. Thank you, Danny. Um, I don't know, between Tim and Neil, who wants to? Yeah, I think Tim first. Sure, Neil, you, you can go for it if, if it's a no, question. No, 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 you go, Tim, you go. All right, thanks, Neil. Oh, so just wanted to come back to that, thanks. I, I think you're right, that trust part's really important, and I recognise that, and the reason I was asking, because Tom reminded me, um, was there some recent conversations we've had around how critical if, like, evidence is, um, and it's that lack of trust, I think, that some uh, our managers and farmers don't have in our evidence, and what we talked about this morning, I think, particularly... Your stuff, Daniel, is really interesting and novel. It could inspire and interest people around actually engaging in that because it's a different way of telling, I think, the story and about the environmental problems um, that we have. So I think it's really important to have a good sound evidence base um, uh, to, to, to do what you want to want to achieve. And thanks, both of you. It's been fascinating this morning. Yeah, I've learned quite a bit. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tim, for integrating this part and for your support. Yanni. Yeah, thanks, Fed. <clears throat> and thanks to you all, uh, especially Martin and Danny. That's been really, really rich exchange. <clears throat> and just picking up on the, the, the point Tom was raising as well. Of course, you know, the variety of stakeholders and the expectations and the needs of um, protected areas and their interaction with pre protected areas need to be taken into account. And going back right to the start, which Federico outlined in terms of the policy ambitions, you know, these are not going to be achieved by um, protected areas alone. It's absolutely essential that protected areas um, and other designated areas need to work together with a variety of stakeholders. And then just to really emphasize what Murta said in particular, I think understanding the problem is absolutely critical. So once the problem can be quite openly, frankly discussed, maybe all of a sudden it doesn't be, remain a problem. And then you can move forward together and you can provide the information which different types of stakeholders need so that they understand why restoration is essential. So that was all I wanted to say, but bravo, really, really good uh, exchanges. And for me, inclusive uh, management of whatever type is always going to be absolutely essential. It's not, um, it's not them or us, it's us together and what we can achieve for nature together. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and thanks all to everyone again. Um, I think that was <laughs> a great conclusion already uh, of, of our discussion this morning and uh, reminding us on building trust, engage, plan, identify the right indicators uh, and, and inspire um, together with, with the importance of sharing knowledge. Uh, if 
we are we've been 250 people in the room for for quite a while and it's impressive the amount of knowledge we all bring around the table so we might have different perspectives uh, we might have specific knowledge on some aspects but we need to work together to to achieve this this won't have be happening tomorrow at least a plan for the coming years and and we need to build a plan together so uh thanks for your questions for the dialogue today um and again uh, as, as Neil said, we need to engage different parties and there are different examples also of, of uh, private experiences of, of restoration and uh, Maurizio has shared a, a link to an interesting site in Italy where restoration has been uh, implemented and, and there's a lot of examples across so we have collected the information on and we'll share the document after this, the webinar. A couple of things I want to remind before saying goodbye. Uh, we will have another webinar on sustainable tourism on the 12th of March, speci specifically looking at measuring tourism environmental impact on the 12th of March at 10 CET. Uh, so please join that or share the, the info. And we are always keen to also evaluate or get feedbacks on uh, our meetings and our webinars. So please. Uh, use the form that uh, Esther is sharing online on the chat uh, just to, to give us a flavor of how it went and any input for, for the future so we can keep improving and making sure we have a good offer for, for you all. So with this, I just want to thank you all. Uh, we're keeping the room open. So if you were still chatting or closing or want to, to add any final remarks, uh, just uh, for this and see you next time on any of the Europark activities.